so my name is Michael, and I've uh, had the privilege to work in recruiting people into studies for the past seven to ten years, and only cure now since we've had that mostly through ACTG trials. Um, this is a look back, and this is sort of my own idiosyncratic way of putting all of this history together. The beginnings of research really were about staying alive. People found trials because they were looking to stay alive, and that's a very uh, motivating factor to get involved in a study. Um, once we had art, once we had the combination therapy, um, often we saw these large treatment uh, naive tre uh, treatment naive studies um, that people had to get involved with because they needed access to those medicines. They didn't have health care, they didn't have the money for that, so research became a way for them to access the medicines until they could get better on their feet. And that brings us to this day today where we have these otherwise healthy individuals living with HIV, and the motivating factor to get involved in cure trials is altruism. And hopefully you can see the difference between staying alive and getting access to something that's beyond yourself is one of the motivating factors to get involved. So out of all of the top types of people that might be interested in an HIV clinical trial, cure trials are looking for some specific individuals. So we have those otherwise healthy individuals who are on art um, who really don't need our trials necessarily. Uh, and uh, we also have then people who have stopped art, who have stopped it maybe for toxicities or because of treatment mm -hmm. fatigue. We also might be looking for people who have some sort of incomplete <coughs> immune recovery um, or people who fail to suppress on art of their HIV. We also specifically might be looking for people who have HIV and cancer, and they might already have been treated and in remission, or we might be needing people who are needing cancer treatment as well as their HIV. We have acutely infected individuals who might be treated early, and then of course in all of these, we're looking at people who might be um, of some sort of uh, minority uh, consideration or women we have, but we also have special considerations for babies, children, and teens. And you can see out of these Venn diagrams, we're talking about small groups of people that might actually be eligible for any of these trials. Um, and then if you add on to that, just trying to find these people, you might think we're looking for some mythological creatures like unicorns. Um, who are we going to find these unicorns? It's small numbers of people that we have, and then add these other barriers that we have. We have limited time and resources for researchers. We have inadequate engagement and education for the community. You have misleading media all the time about HIV cure hype, telling you that it's right around the corner. And then even as researchers, we have some conflicts, and we have no consensus on a lot of the ethical issues that are facing us. Sometimes we can't even decide on what a definition of cure is. All of that creates barriers for these people to actually want to be participating in a cure trial. So how are we going to take those unicorns and make them into cosmonauts? That's the questions that I have for you. Because it's going to take some really special people and we're going to need to get some training for them and some education to make them into those cosmonauts that will understand that they might not actually be cured, but they're going to help us get to a remission or to a cure. How are we going to get there if we don't have the sort of uh, uh, support systems around that to make them into those cosmonauts? And you have to remember that those cosmonauts are human and they're not going to be immune from the perceived benefits of participating in a cure trial. And I'm going to get more to that towards the end. But there are certain definite risks that people have told us already through the qualitative research that the Martin <coughs> Delaney Collaboratory CAB members have done. Um, and so this is from the paper that was... Uh, uh, done by Dubay, and we have some of these things are just definite deal breakers. Uh, the activation of genes that could cause cancer. People don't want to be involved if that's going to happen. They don't want any sort of drug resistance to be developed, and any sort of toxicities or side effects. They told us that that's not in the uh, realm of possibility for them. Procedures. People do not like spinal taps, and definitely they've heard stories about bone marrow transplants, the biopsies that go on there, and how painful they are. They don't want anything that has to deal with that. Also, one of the interesting things in terms of side effects, hair loss. That, if is, they're going to face that, they do not want to participate that possibility. Um, also, vomiting is one of the things that came up there. But the number one thing that kept people from wanting to participate in a trial is transmitting their virus to another partner. If they're going to get rid of that sort of undetectable, equally untransmittable, that thing they fought to have, they don't want to participate in the trial. Um, so that is something that we're really going to have to think about when we're talking about treatment interruptions because that's a very real possibility. So I have these two individuals up here as examples of trying to manage expectations. On the one side is John's story. And John is, uh, used to be a cab member for Defeat HIV. And I put the slogan of his story there, I could die cured. <laughs> Way back when we did our first community science event with our two PIs, one of our PIs mentioned uh, having a trial open up 
where someone would not need to have cancer just with HIV alone, and it dawned on John that he could die cured. And that was such a liberating and motivating uh, experience for him that he thought he was a perfect candidate for cure trials. He saw himself as a way of giving back to research that helped him keep alive for 30-some years until he went through his first screening or pre-screening process where he found out that the CMV that he had basically disqualified him from the rumidepsin study that he was trying to get into, but probably also all the other early cure trials. And so he went way up high with his expectations, and that just went all the way down. And uh, it was really sort of a hard thing to try to manage these expectations as someone who had a lot of concern for him. And on the other side, we have Gary's story, and you might know Gary better as Patient B. And Gary uh, came to uh, Seattle for a community event, which I wanted to sort of plug. It's uh, videotaped by the Seattle Channel, and we have it on our YouTube channel for Defeat HIV. I would recommend you all checking it out. It's a great example of uh, this sort of participant-researcher relationship. But even Gary, who's one of the most perfect examples of who you would want as a cosmonaut, he understood all of the risks. He had a very uh, secure sense of what to expect from it. But even when he became uh, into his third or fourth month of not having the virus rebound, he even began to believe that he may have been cured. And there's really no way as a human being to sort of manage those things, especially if you live with HIV. And so when his virus came back, he then went through the subsequent um, sort of plunge of the emotions and questioning himself and questioning the reasons he got involved in that. And I wanted to just bring all of those up for us as two different stories to th think about when we're talking about trying to manage people's expectations around cure. So what can we do? Well, number one, we can fund community engagement. I can't say it enough. We don't really fund it fully. And if we have these otherwise healthy individuals who are living with HIV but are otherwise healthy, we should be treating them like HIV negative people, which means when we fund this sort of community engagement, we should be having outreach workers, we should be having educators, we should be having part-time uh, uh, recruiters. All of those things that the trials that are looking for negative people to get involved with their uh, prevention interventions, they have all that already and we need that for cure trials. We need to treat them as if they are just like the negative people who don't need our studies to begin with. It's gonna take a lot of convincing to get those cosmonauts. You should plan for early involvement, and you should also plan on the future access to any sort of therapy or procedure that may come out of that. If you have something that works in terms of outreach, you should document it and bring it to things like this to teach other people on how you did it. And also another thing that's really important to me is that we need to reduce the disparities in power. Researchers tend to forget that they are in positions of privilege and power uh, when they're talking to, to community people, and that disparity can really lead to some abuses of power and privilege, and I wanted to keep that in mind. But the last point is to really support effective community responses to HIV. In other words, there are groups and communities that are working on HIV already, and they are perfect people to help you in your research, but you need to be supportive of them, and more than that, you need to be involved with them. You should be supporting your local CBOs that are doing good work in HIV, and figure out ways that you can partner because you're gonna create a fertile field for recruitment when your trials are ready for those uh, people to come to you. Um, and that's all I have to you, so thank you very much. Yeah.